Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Accelerate Your Research program. Uh, today's topic is ORCID, Distinguish Yourself in Your Research. Our, uh, our speaker today is Todd Vision, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Biology, uh, where he studies genome evolution. He's Associate Director of Informatics at Nescent and at the, the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and is on the board of directors at ORCID. Todd? Thanks, David, and thanks everyone for coming out. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, good. Um, so, yeah, uh, my, my name is Todd Vision, but you may better know me as, uh, which screen is better here? You may better know me as 000002. That is my orchid. So, uh, uh, as a researcher, uh, things you want to do, uh, ensuring that your work is discoverable. Um, connected to you, that you get credit to it, that it follows you around in your career from institution to institution and as you change names um, uh, during the course of your life, uh, and minimize the time you spend uh, having to enter your personal profile information in all sorts of different systems and keep those updated and just make sure that that stuff tracks behind the scenes, um, that would be a nice thing, right? So these are um, the kinds of things that ORCID is intended to address. So what I'm going to talk about today is how ORCID works and how it helps with those things, uh, how to get and take advantage of an ORCID uh, for you as an individual researcher. Um, I'm not going to step through all the help screens, but it's fairly simple, so um, get, get you started. And then talk about some of the ways that ORCIDs are currently being integrated into research workflows uh, that researchers are likely to encounter. So things, it's, ORCID's still only about a year old, so many of the sort of behind the scenes things that are happening are not immediately visible to you, but you will probably encounter places where your ORCID is being asked for in the future, and I want to give you a sense of where those places are and how to use them. Um, so if ORCID is the solution, what's the problem exactly? So there's sort of two sides uh, to it. So names can be spelled and abbreviated and presented in lots of different formats. Uh, they may be rendered in different languages. They may be even in the same language, use different characters, especially if you're non-English. Um, there may be a variety of abbreviations. You may have name changes if you get married or for other reasons. Um, and so this is you know, an actual uh, set of variants of someone's name, a Danish researcher. Um, those are all the same person. Uh, you may know enough about Danish names to recognize that, but you may not. Um, so not only do computers and people both have a hard time knowing when two different spellings are the same person, but they also can't tell when the same spelling is used by two different people, right? So a case in point, there are nine faculty members with the first initial J and the last name Smith on the UNC faculty. Right? There are about 32 <coughs> researchers, I think the example was, with the name J. Lee at the University of Michigan. Right? So this is a, a particularly a problem with a, a lot of Asian names. Um, so your ORCID is a 16-digit number, like the one I read out to you at the beginning, and like these examples here, which you can see my mouse working. There we go, yeah. So you can see the ORCID underneath the name here, and you can see the ORCID underneath the name here. Um, so it always has that 4444 four, four, um, profile to it. Um, so as you can see, it, it's not meant to replace your name, but think of it as like a switchboard that connects the different variants of your name um, and connects that identity uh, to all of your research profile and outputs that you want it to be connected to. So for example here, the first of these is connected to uh, this researcher Scopus ID. The second one is connected to their LinkedIn profile. You can see there are different variants of this name. You can see there's a variant here that I can't even read. Um, uh, and so the ORCID is kind of behind the scenes connecting all of this information, both the variants of the names, potentially different email addresses that someone may register with, um, and, and their um, online identity as a researcher. And so this is an example of some John Smiths that are in the ORCID database that all have different ORCIDs. So these are presumably all different people that all have unique identifiers. And rather than um, just referring them to them as a John Smith in the system, we can refer to them by that number and we'll know which one we're talking about. Okay. So it both <coughs> disambiguates between different people and helps link together different variants of yourself, of your own identity. <coughs> so um, why ORCID? So the 
idea is that there be a unique identifier for a researcher that improves the discoverability of the work and that person, uh, enables interoperability between different systems, the funding agency, the journal you publish with, the institution who's keeping track of your research, etc., cetera, um, and that it reduces the amount of repetitive data entry that you as a researcher have to have and the amount of error that exists. If you've ever you know, vanity searched yourself <coughs> in a, um, something like PubMed and you have a common name and that there are other researchers with your name who are part of you know 100-person particle physics teams, you know the problem. So, um, so ORCID's work by being used by different <laughs> systems that connect you and your research outputs and activities, like I say, funders, universities, scholarly societies when you register for meetings, potentially publishers, and so on. So some key features. This one ID stays with you your entire career as you move from institution to institution. Right? So your affiliation can change, but your ID can remain the same. It's not restricted to biology or English or social sciences. It's across disciplines. It's across research sectors, whether you're in, whether you're a student or a faculty member or a national lab or otherwise, it's across um, it's international, and it um, works across languages, so it's an international standard. So it can be used for any kinds of works or activities. It's not just for publications. Some of you familiar with Scopus IDs or researcher IDs have used those in the context of publications. This is more broad than that. So it makes a useful complement uh, to those existing researcher IDs. It's not meant to replace them, um, uh, but it, uh, like I say, it can be a switchboard for them. Uh, and open technology is important to ORCID, so lots of different players can link to them. It's not sort of a proprietary system that's used by one company. So importantly, they're free to you as a researcher. So you can get an ORCID ID, you can use it, there's no cost to you. It's uh, owned by an open, non-for-profit, community-driven organization, like David mentioned, I'm on the board of directors for the past year. Um, and it's supported uh, by members. So these member organizations are of all kinds, of publishers and scientific societies and funders and universities. Um, and these members keep the organization sustainable by paying to have sort of special access to integrate their systems with it. So very broad stakeholder community keeps it sustainable. Um, so since records have only been around for a little over a year, like I say, its future pervasiveness may not be apparent yet. Um, but that's likely to change. It's ramping up pretty quickly. There have been half a million orchids just registered in the past year, almost half a million, and the pace has been picking up rapidly as publishers begin to integrate them into their systems. Um, uh, so you can see here sort of a map of the distribution of where they're most widely used. The U.S. Uh, is big, but also China um, and uh, South Asia are big, and it's also uh, very common in Europe. But it's... Um, <coughs> It's used all over the world. I don't think there's any country on this map that's not represented by at least one ORCID. So, getting your ORCID ID. Um, so in the future, uh, it would be my hope that research institutions, as a matter of course, would create the ORCIDs for their researchers, and that would probably be how it's first generated, and then you would go and claim it. Right now, uh, UNC doesn't, is not a member and doesn't register them on behalf of its employees. So you as a researcher would go and you would um, register and claim your own. Um, so there's, like I say, it's a fairly simple process to do, and there's basically three parts to it. Just registering for it, which is the minimum, gets you your number, you can start using it. Um, you can add your information, you can connect works to it, you can put your past affiliations, link in with other profiles so that it knows um, more about you, and the more information that's in the profile, the better systems are going to be able to be at disambiguating you from others and recognizing that your former self at some other university is the same you as the one that's here. Right? So the more information you add, the better it's going to work. Um, and then once you have the profile uh, set up, then you can begin using it in grant submission systems and manuscript systems and uh, other kinds of places that, uh, that ask for it and where it can be helpful. So an important feature is that you control what information is publicly shared. So even if an employer were to set up your ORCID record, upon claiming, you maintain the sole control over the privacy settings. Uh, and privacy can even be controlled at an individual uh, item level if you link lots of different works to your profile. So there are basically three levels. There's public, data are completely viewable and open for everyone. 
there's limited access. There's the data which are viewable by parties <coughs> that you or someone you designate select. So maybe you say, Thomson Reuters, I trust you to have access to my email and affiliation info, but I don't want that with the whole wide world. Um, and then you can make things private, so data which are not viewable by, by any uh, third parties via the registry. And maybe you have uh, email information that you want to keep closed. So that's fine too. Um, and then you can connect your ORCID IDs to your works. So for articles and data, you can import them from third party databases like Scopus, um, Crossref, and Datacite with uh, these kind of user friendly import tools. So there's little wizards that guide you through it when you register. Uh, you can also add works individually if they're not in those databases or they're wrong in those databases. There's actually a wide variety of other types of works apart from publications that you can link to your profile. Um, books, patents, posters, artistic performances, lectures, speeches. There's a, a, a big vocabulary that comes from a group called CASRI which you can use to select any of those kinds of works. Some of them are better supported now than others, but they're all in principle addable. All right, so if you select an individual import wizard, uh, you can link your other ID. So in this case, it's a researcher ID from Thompson Reuters uh, to your ORCID. Um, import the works after inspecting them and agreeing that they're all yours and setting the privacy settings for them. Um, and uh, that's it. Then, then your researcher ID knows your ORCID and your ORCID knows your researcher ID and then you can update those in the future together. Uh, so here's my completed profile page. Uh, it has some basic profile info, links to some of my other IDs. So here's my ORCID uh, there, and a uh, link to my website, researcher ID, Scopus ID. Um, and uh, there's also information that's not shared on this page, which is my email. Uh, and my works are listed here, publications first, and then other stuff below it keeps on going. And uh, I just want to point out also on this page, there's a little ideas tab here. And if you are using ORCID and you're like, boy, it'd be really nice to have some feature, you can go see what other people have proposed, propose your own, add votes to them, and get notified when stuff actually comes out. Because it's, like I say, it's only a year old, so there's lots of things being developed behind the scenes all the time. All right, so let's take a look at some of the ways that you would use your ORCID had one today. So the NIH uh, has developed an application called uh, CyanCV, I think that's how they say it, uh, to facilitate the sharing of biosketch information across uh, for grant and fellowship applications across multiple federal agencies, although right now I think the NIH is the chief agency that's using it. Um, and you can see, as you can see here, you can link oops, my mouse. Here's the CyanCV form, and you can link an ORCID. Uh, to Science IV, and in the future, hopefully, that will allow you to um, update your Science IV with works in your ORCID profile, and vice versa. Right now, it's just a just a link, but uh, that's the aim: is to have these things synchronized and down the road. Uh, in publications, so one publisher that's incorporated uh, ORCID already is Nature Publishing Group. So when you um, register for nature.com account or you submit uh, something to one of their journals, or 90 some journals, you can uh, link that to your ORCID ID and nature will then, in the metadata behind the article, uh, convey that ORCID to indexers like PubMed and ISI so that things can be found via your ORCID through these third party indexers. So it enables discoverability. Um, and enables nature to know that it's the same person that submitted manuscripts from different institutions at different times. Um, and like I say, it's not just publications that you can link, any other kinds of works. So this is an example, Figshare is a, a repository that has all kinds of things in it, data and posters and slides and so on. Um, and Figshare and Dryad and other kinds of disciplinary and institutional repositories uh, mint DOIs like articles, but they don't mint them from the same registry. They mint them from a group called Datacite, and there's a Datacite importer for ORCID. So if you use any of these repositories that use DOIs for kind of non-publication stuff, you can import all of that bibliographic information into your ORCID profile with this Datacite import tool, um, which is shown here. So the universities and institutions that have begun Incorporating this, this is an example, UNC doesn't do this yet, 
but this is a uh, public uh, profile uh, on a website at Boston University, which is one of the institutions that's uh, begun to use these internally. So here's the researcher, and I can't see the screen very well, but his work is up there somewhere. So his ORCID ID is shown here. Um, and that connects with internal systems the way it might connect with, say, Ramsey's, if people are familiar with that system at UNC. And so it would track your grant applications, connect those to the actual grant that's funded with the works that come out of it, and uh, simplify the tracking of, of reporting within the university. So if this is a feature that you think would be valuable to you at UNC, uh, the party that would be uh, interested in knowing, I think, would be the Office of Sponsored Research. Um, and even if the institution doesn't mint uh, the ORCID for you or use it internally, you can use it yourself uh, to um, make sure that people are aware of your identity in your various guises. So here's a website where someone has put it on their personal profile page. You can put it on a CV, put it in the email signature, right? So you can use it personally even if the institution doesn't use it. All right, so that's um, the overview of uh, what I want to talk about. So just to summarize, so your, your ORCID ID can be used to link uh, nearly all the kinds of works that you would output to you uh, and only to you, no matter what name you use or how similar your name is to other people's, which is important. Uh, it can help reduce the need to enter the same profile information into multiple systems and to keep that information updated and correct. Uh, you control your profile information um, the, the, uh, you correct the things that are shown there, you control what information you wish to share, what organizations you wish to give trust to uh, for access to your profile. The work is portable across systems, it's portable across institutions, throughout your career, etc. Um, and it can be used as a switchboard that links to other IDs that you may have attached to your person. Uh, and it's free for you as a researcher, um, and it's supported by a, a Nonprofit, so it's not a you're not giving your data to a company that's making its money by selling you uh, your person or sending you advertisements. So um, that is all I wanted to cover. So to learn more, there's a um, library guide, at, uh, the science, uh, health, and natural sciences library team here put together um, uh, on the top website. Which is, uh, covers ORCIDs as well as some of the other identifiers that you may commonly encounter, like Scopus and Researcher ID. There's uh, a lot of information on the ORCID knowledge base, obviously. And if you have questions or want uh, customized personal help, um, there's an email address for the science help team at the library. And uh, maybe the, the liaisons who are here can stand up uh, Barry and David, Barry Hayes, David Romito, and Diane Ann. Um, it's over there. Um, and uh, if you're interested in uh, what UNC is doing or not doing uh, with ORCID integration, then uh, Andy Johns from uh, Research Office would be a good contact.